Hey everybody and welcome to the Five Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors. Liquidware, the innovator in adaptive workspace management solutions. And also brought to you by Policy Pack Software, now part of Netrix, where you use Group Policy or MDM to remove admin rights, manage lockdown applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware, plus more. And of course, also brought to you by ControlUp, end-to-end digital experience management for the work-from-anywhere era. Control up. Happy users, happy IT. If you enjoy the show each week, you have these awesome sponsors to thank. And now for some news. Well, it has happened. Internet Explorer 11 has retired and is officially out of support. According to Microsoft, over the next few months, opening Internet Explorer will progressively redirect users to Microsoft Edge with IE mode. Users will still see the Internet Explorer icon on their devices, but if they click to open Internet Explorer, Edge will open instead with easy access to IE mode. Eventually, IE will be disabled permanently as part of a future Windows update, at which point the Internet Explorer icons on users' devices will be removed. As part of the redirection process, users will have their data like favorites, passwords, and settings imported from IE into Edge to help transition. If a user wants to delete or manage their data at any point after that, they can always do so in Edge from the settings menu. Some websites only work in Internet Explorer, and for these websites, Microsoft encouraged the use of IE mode in Edge which I believe the findings for most is that IE mode works for the majority of sites that only work in IE today, but there are some outliers that just won't work in IE mode. So I think the app assurance program might be some help if you have sites like that that won't work. But after the redirection phase is complete, Internet Explorer will permanently be disabled on devices via that Windows update. So. You know, there's going to be, I guess, somewhat of a grace period between now and when that kind of trickle out process of removing IE takes place. They say for certain versions of Windows currently in support and used in critical environments, they will continue to support Internet Explorer on these versions until they go out of support. And that includes all currently in support Windows 10 LTSC releases, including IoT, and all Windows Server versions, as well as the Windows 10 China Government Edition, Windows 8.1, and Windows 11 with extended security updates. Future versions of these editions will not include Internet Explorer. Developers who rely on the underlying MSHTML platform and COM controls on Windows will also continue to be supported on those Windows platforms. And of course, Microsoft have committed to continuing to support IE mode and Edge through at least 2029. Well, another month and another patch Tuesday. As is usually the case, the first week the patches are available, there is information available online, and that's what I draw off for these stories of Patch Tuesday and the week of Patch Tuesday. But usually, the following couple weeks, There's the fallout stories from issues related to patches, so be sure to keep tuned to this show and keep subscribed because over the next couple of weeks, I'll probably tell you some of the fallout. But just information around the Windows updates this month. There are a total of 55 fixes this month for Windows updates, and one of those is for a zero day. Uh, Three of the vulnerabilities were deemed critical and the rest were important. This includes 12 elevation of privilege vulnerabilities, one security feature bypass vulnerability, 27 remote code execution vulnerabilities, 11 information disclosure vulnerabilities, three denial of service vulnerabilities, and one spoofing vulnerability. So while Microsoft were slow to call Felina a zero day, Felina being a vulnerability that I talked about pretty extensively in the last couple of episodes of the podcast, well, it appears that the one zero day being addressed this month is that Felina vulnerability. The register reports that in addition to mitigating Felina, Microsoft plugged three critical remote code execution flaws and said none of them have been actively exploited yet. The most severe of the three is CVE-2022-30136, which received a 9.8 out of 10 on the severity score. 
This affects the Windows Network file system or NFS. And Microsoft noted exploitation is more likely for this bug and said that it can occur if a miscreant who is already on the network makes an unauthenticated, specially crafted call to an NFS service to execute remote code. Another one of the critical remote code execution vulnerabilities is Dash 22 Dash 2022 Dash 30163, and this is in the Hyper V hypervisor. That received an 8.5 out of 10. And it's a fairly complex attack to pull off, according to the report. But if exploited, it could be used to move from a guest virtual machine to the host, where you could potentially administer a lot of damage. And the third RCE that's being highlighted in this report by the register is dash 2022 dash 30139. And that's in lightweight directory access protocol or LDAP. So as usual, Windows updates are covering a pretty wide spectrum of Microsoft products. Another vulnerability worth highlighting is CV-2022-30147. And that's a Windows installer elevation of privilege vulnerability, and that gets a 7.8 out of 10. The register notes that this kind of vulnerability is almost always seen during a cyber attack. And Microsoft, to their part, marked this bug as likely to be exploited. And before I move away from some of the Windows updates and the vulnerabilities patched this month, I also wanted to talk about CVE-2022-30189, which is that one spoofing vulnerability that I alluded to a little bit earlier. And this one's interesting because it's in the Windows Autopilot feature and specifically within the enrollment. It's said that with this, an attacker could use a Microsoft account device ticket playback from one device to another and allows a second non-authorized device to perform an Azure Active Directory join and to replace the original device. So that one sounds pretty serious. As always, some of the other vendors have also released patches at the same time, including Adobe, Intel, SAP, and more. And I'll share a link to articles covering a lot of those with this episode, which is episode 234, and you'll find that at fivebytespodcast.com under reference links. And just right before I leave this story, at the time of this recording, the Intel patches are drawing some attention in the community as they've covered a pretty major vulnerability codenamed Hertz Bleed that they have been accused of sitting on since the third quarter of last year. If that one blows up into a bigger story, expect me to cover it next week. It's kind of a breaking story at the time that I scripted this episode. One of the other vendors releasing patches is Citrix, who warned that vulnerabilities have been discovered in Citrix Application Delivery Management, or ADM, that if exploited could result in a couple of security issues, including corruption of the system by a remote, unauthenticated user, and the impact of this can include the reset of the admin password at the next device reboot, allowing an attacker with an SSH access to connect with the default administrator password after the device is rebooted. And also, temporary disruption of the ADM license service. The impact of this includes preventing new licenses from being issued or renewed by Citrix ADM. The CVEs for these is CVE-2022-27511, and CVE-2022-27512, respectively. All supported versions of ADM server and ADM agent are affected by this vulnerability. In general, Citrix strongly recommends that network traffic to the ADM's IP address is segmented, either physically or logically, from standard network traffic, and they say that doing so diminishes the risk of exploitation of these types of issues. Citrix recommends that affected customers install relevant updated versions of the ADM server and ADM agent as soon as possible with Citrix ADM 13.1-21.53 and later versions of 13.1 and version 13.0-85.19 and later versions of 13.0. And speaking of Citrix, they announced some enhancements for their team support and integration recently, including simultaneous outgoing video and outgoing screen sharing are now enabled in Ring 4. That's in CWA 2109 or higher for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS with no VDA dependency. It also looks like a tech preview for background blurring and other effects 
for the camera is now available and multi-window is now enabled in Ring 4 as well. A new vulnerability in Max with M1 chips has been disclosed by MIT researchers that could allow threat actors to remotely bypass pointer authentication in the kernel from the user space. Apple says this new side channel attack doesn't represent a danger to Mac users, given that it also requires other security vulnerabilities to be effective. BleepyComputer.com points out that while it is concerning that this vulnerability is tied to the M1 hardware and the fact that Apple can't patch this hardware to block attacks using the exploitation technique, the good news here is that end users don't need to be worried as long as they keep their software up to date and free of bugs that could be exploited to gain execution, such as the exploit called Pac-Man that was shared for this particular vulnerability. Microsoft's Notepad and Media Player apps for Windows 11 will now support ARM64 natively, which is a big deal and yet again keeps hopes alive that Microsoft is still working towards a better battery efficient operating system. According to OnMSFT.com, in addition, the Notepad app gained some general performance and accessibility improvements with the recent updates that you'll notice, especially when scrolling very large files or replacing large amounts of text across all devices in version 11.2205 and higher available in the dev channel. And there's some other additional enhancements in there too. Unfortunately, these updates are limited to Windows Insiders and there's no timetable for when they'll be pushed into general Windows 11 desktops. Ars Technica reported this week that a popular service used by open source developers called Travis CI has been leaking thousands of authentication tokens and other security sensitive secrets. Many of these leaks allow hackers to access the private accounts of developers on GitHub, Docker, AWS and other code repositories, security experts said in a new report. The tokens give anyone with access to them the ability to read or modify the code in repositories that distribute an untold number of ongoing software apps and code libraries. The ability to gain unauthorized access to such projects opens the possibility of supply chain attacks in which threat actors tamper with malware before it's distributed to users. So think about the whole SolarWinds supply chain hack as an example. Some examples of access tokens that were reportedly exposed include access tokens to GitHub that may allow privileged access to code repos, AWS access keys, sets of credentials, typically an email or username and password, which allow data access to databases such as MySQL or PostgreSQL, and also Docker Hub passwords, which may lead to account takeover, especially if MFA is not activated. In some more cheery news, for those working in marketing or even just in the field of creating content for your work role, there is some good news. The Verge has reported that Adobe plans to launch a freemium version of Photoshop. The free version is currently available only in Canada for this initial test phase. As this is freemium, you can expect them to gate off certain features in order to upsell them. Personally, I hope it will have full layering capabilities and some of the richer image editing features. Um, some of these are already available on the mobile app, so it'd be nice to have it in this browser app that they're talking about. I also hope it doesn't stick a watermark on all the images that you save from it, but unfortunately details of how they'll handle the freemium release remains to be seen, and they do not have a date for when it will become available more widely, so until then, at least I'll be sticking with uh, paint.net. If you haven't used paint.net, I encourage you to check it out. Microsoft have announced two new reports available in public preview for eligible MEM customers. It includes Windows Feature Update Device Readiness Report, which is a selects a target version of Windows that you plan to deploy and provides a device-by-device -device view of any compatibility risks that may be encountered during or after the feature update or upgrade. And also the Windows Feature Update Compatibility Risks Report, which finds a summary of the top compatibility risks across your organization so you can prioritize which risks to address first. It said use of these new reports require specific Windows licensing. And these new reports require that your devices are running a supported version of Windows 10 or later with the latest cumulative update. For a full list of the requirements, 
I suggest you check out the link that I'll share with this episode that you'll find at a 5 podcastcom under reference links for episode 234. And also, before I jump away from this, note, anyone using the desktop analytics already should be aware that this is being retired on November 30th, 2022. So not much time left on that. And I think if you go to that icon within MEM, you get warned about it already anyways. Popular text editor Atom which launched 11 years ago, is set to be archived on December 15th of this year following an announcement from GitHub. Atom was the foundation for the Electron framework, which was featured in the development of popular apps like Slack, Visual Studio Code, and more. GitHub says it will refocus its efforts on Microsoft Visual Studio Code and GitHub Code Spaces, its cloud-powered development environment. So for your text editor and development needs, I guess they intended for you to use those going forward. Now, as this is open source, it is just being archived, so it's not going to fully go away. Anyone who would like to continue contributing to its maintenance and continue using it will be free to do so. And now some quick hit stories to wrap up the news this week. But Michael Bazarski shared that it's now possible to browse Microsoft's public Docker images in the Microsoft Artifact Registry. And this adds to the existing ability to be able to find the Microsoft public Docker images on the actual official Docker hub. So I guess a second place to be able to find those images. Bloomberg reported this week that Citigroup is expected to hire 4,000 technical staff to tap into what it's called a digital explosion off the back of the pandemic changing how we work with technology. They want to digitize and modernize how they do business with both clients and their workers. They believe an aggressive strategy in terms of technology will pay dividends. So that's interesting because we've heard about the advent of things like digital experience, investment into technology, uh, more focus on end user computing than ever before in terms of driving productivity and just like listening to your employees in terms of their digital needs. But at the same time, we've also been hearing some doom and gloom about tech companies having layoffs and uh, an impending recession, which it looks like there's going to be a global recession. But I guess it's a bit of a conundrum there because as we're hitting this recession, there's also this market where companies are looking to employ people and they're having a hard time doing so so they're trying to focus more on their needs like that experience which again drives a need for technical expertise so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the long term but perhaps Citigroup is just an indication of what other organizations are going to do which is invest heavily in technology applications have opened for the second half of 2022 V expert 2022 program so if you'd like to become a v expert the second half applications are now open so apply just a quick reminder that the cloud paging user group online meetup is going to be held on the 17th of june so that should be pretty soon if you're listening to this early on when i release it and i'll be at 2 30 p.m irish summertime british summertime 3 30 p.m central european summertime And that's about 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And I think we're going to be covering the topics of uh, how to handle upgrading the agent or the cloud paging player. We'll also go through examples of handling complex packaging of applications. And I hope we have a general discussion amongst the group about all things application delivery. So if you'd like to join, I'll share the link to that. Just register, save the calendar item. And then you'll be directed to the meetup to grab the Teams link when it's time. And now this episode's scripts, tricks, and tips. My buddy David O'Brien shared a tip on his Twitter account this week, and you should follow him. That's at David underscore O'Brien. He said simply, quote, repeat after me, buying a SIM does not make me more secure if I have nobody to look at data in the sim or nobody who understands the data in said sim. Start by applying MFA and taking your Windows servers off the internet. Get a sim at step 20 or so. So I fully agree with that. One of the problems with uh, massive amounts of data is it's only 
useful if you've got subject matter experts dedicated to uh, working with that data on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's certainly monitoring products that aren't as overwhelming. There may be a little more tunnel vision that can produce a easier to use or more easy to digest version. But even then you still need to have staff who are going to be able to be proactive with the information they're getting. And finally, Thomas Maurer had a great blog post on how to reset RDP and admin passwords of an Azure VM. So this is kind of in the realm of uh, security too and something that you may want to know if you're moving to the cloud. So apologies, I kind of ran out of steam toward the end there. Uh, I've been very sick this week, which I also apologize for because you're probably going to hear in the audio of this episode. But sick or not, I'm really happy that I got this episode done and I still haven't missed a week. <laughs> so if you've been listening every week, thank you so much for also sticking with it and I'll catch you next week.